All right, everyone. Uh, this is Black Mamba 44 coming back at you, and as promised, I will be taking us down to Paradise City, where the grass is green, the girls are pretty. Um, but more than that, we can go down to Vendering's Well. Um, I think that we will go to Tunin's Court first. Uh, that should take two days, seven hours, thirty minutes. And this. Oh, encounter in Vendrian's Well. As you walk along the bank of a small stream, you're splashing coming from the reedy shallows. You recognize it as the sound of the rush fish. While no delicacy, the flesh of the rush fish is a common staple in Tearsman cuisine. You look down into the water and see three of the whiskered creatures, fat and oblivious. Have verse hunted. Like shooting fish in a stream. Verse quips as she readies an arrow. Flashing moments later, she's pulled the slimy creatures from the muck and presented them to you, skewered on her feathered shafts. Alright, so we have two raw meat. No, not me. Alright. I see what uh, Landry was talking about last time, though. That spire is part of the old walls, so is that. And that one, this is the only one that's on its own. Interesting. Alright. So we're finally back at Tunin's Court. Um, I like to side with Tunin, because um, I think that Tunin is pretty decent choice. Um, so we have to report to him. So we have Disfavored, Scarlet Chorus, and these are Fate Binders. You call yourselves officers of Kairos' army, but your conduct falls short of my expectations. The court finds your accounts of Vendrian's well lacking, rife with misdirection and fallacy, fouled with baseless accusation. We will listen. All right, so, Abatronus, your honor, I have relayed the events as I experienced them. You can well imagine why my version conflicts with his. On my honor and on that of the great general, I would sooner snap my sword than perjure myself before you, Archon. Oh, so you, so you imply that falsehood comes easier to my lips than yours? You're a fool if you believe the Archon of Justice won't see through your lies because the disfavored think themselves better than an honest gang. Silence. The contradictions in your statements will be examined, and falsities threshed from truths. If we find you have perjured yourselves, Blood and Mark will see to your fate. Fatebinder, we will start with the matter of the Archons. Graven Ash and the voices of Nerat have declared war upon each other. In addition to violating Kairos's peace, they have thrown the conquest of the Tears into disarray. By all accounts, these hostilities began shortly after your arrival. Tell us what transpired. So uh, the Archons could not agree on who should lead the siege and descended into accusations of treachery. It seemed a mutual spat. So the disfavored were more deserving of the honor. Our tactics and training outmatched the Vendrian Guard every turn. What bought a dash? The disfavored couldn't tip over a straw hut if they had a week to strategize. Our howling mob was better equipped to overwhelm the Vendrian Guard. Our recruits were ready to throw themselves at the enemy, if only Ash and his legion would agree to a plan. The Fatebinder presents testimony. I warn you both against speaking out of turn. Something more than a mere disagreement unraveled this campaign. But I will return to that in time. Let us speak of Ascension Hall. From all accounts, it would seem you were instrumental in its capture, or so the petitioner of the Scarlet Chorus testifies. The disfavored commander has a dimmer view of the matter. Lend me your perspective. I joined with the Scarlet Chorus. We took the Citadel with an unstoppable advance. The edict meant certain doom if the siege failed. So why, when your survival depended on it, did you join your strength to the Scarlet Chorus, and not the Elite Disfavored? 
And we can say the voices of Narat was willing to win the Citadel at any cost. Ash values his army more than his duty to Kairos. I will consider this testimony at length. The court thanks you for it. Is there anything you wish to add at this time? I have told you all that I know. Your testimony is accepted by the court. The statements of our guests raise questions in my mind. There is much about this campaign that has caused me to wonder. A shipment of iron weapons was short on arrival. Where coveted iron is concerned, I don't believe it to be a clerical error. One of my agents recovered this seal in Echo Call. It belongs to a merchant collective. Lethian's Crossing is teeming with their kind. If you would root out treachery, I would advise starting there. Petitioners, leave us. I would have a private audience with the Fatebinder. Ascend and join me. You will find the way opened. End conversation. Alright, that's Tunin. And, huh. You can probably guess. I fucking love his voice. I think it's astounding. His voice of uh, like I like I said, I just can't keep I can't stop harping on how great the voices are. Uh, so yeah, so we're gonna go up here, uh, do a little quick save. Um, we're gonna talk to the boy to Tunin. Jesus, Tunin. This civil war, this feud, is an insult to Kairos's peace. It should not have taken the better part of a year to silence the last vestiges of the Oathbreakers. I agree, Your Honor. Our allies squabble while our enemies regroup. It falls upon the court to measure the extent of the damage and to execute the agents of disorder. I suspect that treachery, negligence, disunity, and greed have infected one or both of our esteemed allies. Until you are instructed otherwise, this matter is the court's primary focus. Graven Ash and the voices of Nerat must be examined in close detail. You are charged with observing the Archons and presenting your case that one of them has wrought chaos and disorder upon the tears. Uh, make this my mission, Your Honor. As always, you will be held accountable for what you do in the court's name. But you are free to conduct your investigation in the manner of your choosing. You must expect lies, misdirection, and manipulation. Suffer not such obstructions of justice. They say the voices of Nerat holds you in higher regard than most. Use this alliance to enter his confidence. It seems unlikely the Archon of Secrets is more honest with friends than with rivals. But to his friends, he has been known to divulge much. The disfavored will likely be less cooperative with your investigation. They will no doubt assume Graven Ash's honor is beyond reproach, which is all the more reason to scrutinize the Archon of War closely. And if the ironclad forces discourage your inquiry, I charge you to make them talk. Speak their language of battle if you must. Extracting information from the disfavored sounds like a worthy challenge. Remember, your bloodlust must always be tempered by Kairos's laws. You may defend yourself against the disfavored. Because they are warring with the Scarlet Chorus, you may claim the defense of the Chorus. Your fellow Fatebinders have been busy acting as my eyes and ears. I have a few leads for you to follow. You should of course speak with your brothers and sisters of the court if you need further counsel. The disfavored have made use of the Sage's network of dovecoats and messenger birds as they come under capture. I've heard multiple claims of strategic communications gone missing. The sages are broken, their citadel in flames, but they were not slaughtered to the last. Some of their numbers still congregate around the smoking husk of their burning library. If they have been reading disfavored communications, learn what they learned, then execute them. The Oathbreakers were reported to be using iron armaments, more than they might acquire from looting what few disfavored they killed. Any iron in the tears not rusted through was made by forge-bound hands in Lethian's crossing. Between craftsman and quartermaster, someone let iron fall into enemy hands. Investigate this matter, and bring the thieves to justice. There is a final matter to discuss. A sensitive topic. What concerns the court, your honor? 
In spite of the many shortcomings at Vendrian's well, you managed to make a name for yourself. You proclaimed an edict of Kairos, resolved its demanding conditions, and ascended the mountain spire. Any one of these feats would be worthy of recognition by the highest authority. You managed to accomplish three. So, uh, I am in a privileged position to accomplish incredible, in incredible deeds. It pleases me that you grasp your role, as long as you temper it with a sense of duty. Whether by design or by accident, you have captured the attention of Kairos' army and the local tearsmen alike. This is no small opportunity, and the court charges you with exploiting your new standing to its fullest potential. You have a title in our hierarchy. However, it's a little-known secret that one's standing in the world is determined by their infamy, their deeds, and how they come to be known. Mind this notion as you bring justice to this lawless frontier. There may come a time when your deeds speak for you louder than any title. If your killing spree in the bastard city is any indication, you are no stranger to spreading infamy already. Whatever you did to capture the attention of the masses at Vendrian's well, I would encourage you to do so again. Understood. I will be known as a champion of justice. Good. It falls to us to set a new standard for these southern barbarians. You are dismissed. Should the court have need of your presence, you will receive word. Go forth and do my bidding, and bring glory and honor to the tears in Kairos' name. End conversation. And he's gone. Yeah, he just... up. Oh, I guess he goes here. Um... So, these are the three Fate Binders that we can talk with. There's Mocking Blaze, there's Bitter Quip, there's Blood Mulch, there's Aurora, uh, Cavius, and that guy. Uh, so, we can talk with all of them. Uh, let's try talking with Aurora and see what happens, because I know that we were chill. So, she avoids making eye contact. Alright, so let's talk with a Fate Binder Rogalus. Fate Binder, you return. You look as if you have questions for me to untangle. Ask. I am feeling generous. You tell me about some of the past Archons. Nox Myria. Nox Myria, the Archon of Pestilence, was disliked in her circles. When she opened her eyes to see and her mouth to speak, it is said that flies would gust into the air, swimming so thick as to blang the sky. She died in the 20th year of her birth, following a string of unusual and grotesque symptoms. So where did you study when you were younger? I've been a ward of the court for as long as I've been aware. As a child, I demonstrated holy, perfect recall, and I absorbed all that tuning my tutors had to offer. I remember hating all the lectures and wishing I could learn at my pace. Funny how I envied the sages of the tears, how they could spend their whole lives reading and never exhaust their library. Of course, now the Belm Citadel is nothing more than a burning waste. What can you tell me about the other Fate Binders? You need to be more specific than that, I'm afraid. There is, on last count, slightly more than a handful of us. Now, what's your opinion of the Fate Binder of War? Nunavol's keen, brash, and a hearty bragger with a fondness for bloodshed. He can be utterly unbearable at times. His justice is fair, even if he skews toward rather exacting, uncompromising punishment at times. Uh, what's your opinion of the Fate Binder of Balance? Kalio is the finest among us. Her discernment is beyond reproach, and she is perhaps Tunin's favorite. She has mind for suspicion, and an observation that makes others uneasy. We who operate within the confines of the law have nothing to fear, of course. Uh, what's your opinion of me? I pondered your impulsive nature. It vexes me constantly. Your support of the Scarlet Chorus only affirms my belief that you're among the more severe and unpredictable members of our office. Uh, let's talk about something else. Can you tell me about the Old Walls and the Bane? Uh, with which should I start? Tell me about the Old Walls. We know little enough about the ancient structures to say that they predate all historical record. The forbidding ruins crisscross the tiers and north alike centuries before we raised our cities. The only one old enough to guess is likely Kairos. Tell me about the Bane. 
The Bane are found in the Old Walls, but much of their defining qualities still escape me. They are creatures of Smoke, Claw, and Fang. If you find yourself unfortunate enough to fight one, remember that spells are effective against them, but grab the attention of others lurking near. Uh, let's discuss something else. I'd like to know more about the Tears. Uh, the political entities of the Tears are essentially split, split between the Bastard Tier, the Younger Realms, and the Free Cities. Which would you like to know? Uh, what can you tell me about the Bastard Tier? Uh, Bastard Tier is the most northern of the Tears and was first to bow down to Kairos' reign, though the knee they bent fell unwillingly. Kairos had his eye on the Bastard Tier for many years before he marched on her capital city. Uh, this is the hub of trade and commerce. Claim the markets and the people will follow. I'm curious to know more about the Younger Realms. Uh, younger Realms sprawl the middle and southernmost tiers and can be catalogued as follows. Apex, Azure, Haven, and Stalwart. Azure was renowned for its exceptionally fertile land which fed the whole of the tiers. That was before Kairos' Edict of Stone blighted the land. Stalwart is also worth mentioning for it comprises the whole of the southernmost tier and provides the toughest and most defensible of the realms. It is often said that the other realms will not fall while Stalwart yet stands. Local army wages bitter war against the disfavored, though the Edict of Storms has cut off the best of their defenses. It is only a matter of time before Stalwart falls. I'd like to hear more about the Free Cities. There are three Free Cities remaining. Last Harbor, Spyro's Maw, and Barris and Chains. First and strongest of the Free Cities was Setting Sun, which Kairos crushed in 429 with the Edict of Tumult. After that, the remaining free cities were quick to surrender. Previous questions. I want to talk about the sages. I will not speak of the sages. They are no better than charlatans and cons, who only selfish in their ill pursuit to hoard all knowledge from others. They are self-blinded by their own deceptions and clever manipulations. They alone cause their own undoing and are solely to blame for the burning library, one of the most grievous of wrongs in the known histories for which they can never be forgiven. Farewell. And then we can talk to Fatebinder Calio. Linux, I see you've returned to the fold. Your exploits in Vendrian's Well are the matter of some discussion. What can I do for you? Uh, has anything happened while I was away? Uh, Nunaval was dispatched to Salwart to break the stalemate between the locals and the disfavored. He, pr he proclaimed Kairos' Edict of Storms, shattering the country with winds unending. Um... You seem to know much of my actions. Have you been spying on me? Don't act so surprised. It's my duty to ensure that those who operate under the adjudicator's name adhere to the spirit of the law, if not the very letter. Of course, I have nothing to hide. So you say, but I have to weigh all evidence presented before me with an objective eye. Assume you are being watched, Fatebinder, but don't concern yourself. That's no more than any citizen of the Empire can expect. Uh, how have you occupied your time in the Bastard City? Tunin sends me on assignments here and there. I sell disputes between the locals when the adjudicator is otherwise occupied. Everything from trade disagreements to pushing chorus squatters out of basements. Real rewarding work. Uh, the glory of war is not an honor reserved for the likes of us. We're the fish swimming in Tunin's wake, picking up scraps along the way. We're rather large and imposing compared to the bottom feeders of the tiers, but fish all the same. Like no more about Tunin. Tunin is our overlord's fair and exacting adjudicator. He speaks with the voice of Kairos' law, and his word is judgment. All of this and more you can learn by asking him yourself. Go on, or does he intimidate you still? <laughs> I jest, of course. I have some concerns about the war. You are free to share them in my confidence. Um... So our armies squabble in each other's throats, divided we cannot win. I'm less concerned about the armies than the Archons themselves. There can be no more there can be no order when mounds collide. Who would you see as champion? Uh, the Scarlet Chorus, the ruthlessness will win this war. Strength in the numbers, who could ever hope to stand against the swelling multitude of the chorus? And yet the army moves without tact, kills without thought, marches on half rations at best, and is subject to madness and brilliance in equal measure. Wars have been won with fewer advantages, though I wonder if this hot course is equal to the challenge. Farewell. And last but not least is Nunaval. Favor Tunin. Ah, Linux, you returned. Unscathed and more acclimated than and more acclaimed than ever. As seems to be your way. 
Uh, come, you must regale me with all that your journey has held. I could use a moment of respite between friends. Speak as you wish. I'd pay a boar's weight in rings to know your thoughts. Come, let us speak freely. Uh, so, how are you singled out to become a fate binder? I cannot speak for the other fate binders, but I joined the court when I was yet still a boy and impetuous beyond reason. I had been imprisoned with a death sentence for the crime of desecrating corpses. Ho 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 ho! It was nothing so exciting as you're no doubt imagining. I was merely burning corpses that were awaiting burial. Before the local authorities could see me to the gallows, the adjudicator claimed me a great talent waiting to be realized, needing only to be steered. Um, why was it a crime? Uh, there was a time when even the Northmen were of suspicious stock, a time before Kairos brought reason to the realms. People in my city believed that, without proper rights, I was cheating our fallen warriors from returning to the land. Uh, so why burn the bodies? Uh, corpses piling in the streets spread plague faster than the filthiest of rats. I was but ten and a weak fighter. I did what I could for my homeland. It's a good thing Tunin spared you. As I have said, the adjudicator saw within me something of rare value, as is true for us all. You are well, you as well were chosen for a great court, for which I am grateful. As a fate finder of war, I rely heavily on your talents. Let's talk about something else. I'm curious about Tunin's masks. They can be rather unsettling, can't they? Um, even to one such as me. But I can assure you, the innocent need not fear their objective, emotionless gaze. What are the adjudicator's masks specifically? Would you like to know? I want to know about the silent face. Uh, the silent face is a face that Tunin shows to us now, and for that we are fortunate beyond belief. Silent face is a patient face, a face for listening as Tunin presides over all matters brought to the court, taking great pains to ensure all sides of an issue are heard. I want to know about the face of resolve. Tunin's last no dawning of the face of resolve was a moment he judged and called ruin to half the districts in the bastard city. Since then, he has ruled our northern tier justly, calmly, and with efficient diplomacy. Um, I want to know about the face that is no more. Tunin is said to have worn a third mask in eons past. I have heard rumor that the face displeased Kairos and thus was destroyed, as happens to all persons and objects that displease our overlord. Have you ever seen Tunin change his masks? And the way you or I would change our raiment? No, not as such. And yet I have seen the masks shift. They switch without the adjudicator or anyone so much as laying a hand on them. It's not something you can watch unfold. After a time, you merely realize it has already happened. Uh, there is work enough for the court that we shouldn't occupy ourselves wondering over mysteries. Uh, something else? Uh, could you remind me of the history and origin of the Fate Binders? So... Uh, we are a relatively young order, though we have spanned these past two centuries. While the voices of Narat and Graven Ash need armies to execute their will, Tunin wields but a modest court of vassals. We exist as the extension of his law. There is no place in all of Teratus beyond our judgment. Uh, tell me more about Kairos' armies, our allies. Ah yes, with friends like these, our work is often self-explanatory. Are you asking about the Scarlet Chorus or the Disfavored? So, start with Scarlet Chorus. Uh, Scarlet Chorus soldiers hail from every corner of every realm. As the chorus, mar chorus marches it, conscripts indiscriminately from... As the chorus marches, it conscripts indiscriminately from those it has conquered to replenish its ranks. Uh, there is no continuity of command in the chorus. Narad allows, encourages even the strong to challenge their leaders. But the chorus has numbers, and brute force is almost always a viable solution, much as Rogulus insists otherwise. Inside, the Scarlet Chorus draws strength from the multitudes it swallows. Its blood chanters have taken knowledge from various tiers mystics. Many of the chorus's best soldiers were grown here in the south. Oh, the Disfavored. The Disfavored are the iron tip of Kairos's great phalanx. Armed with the best weapons, the most comprehensive training, led by the brilliant Graven Ash, the Disfavored have no equals in open battle. Legion has a saying, Graven Ash protects, and it's no empty boast. The Archon of War is able to lend his will and strength to his soldiers, and give them endurance beyond human limits. I have great respect for the Disfavored, but I know where I stand with them. They are a very close-knit band, all of them from northern families, many of them relate to each other. Yeah, but considering a role in the Great Hierarchy, I can't fault Graven Ash for being selective. Uh, I've claimed the Spire at Vendrian's well. 
So the court's whispers are true. Someday I would like to witness for myself this tower that has risen above the realms like a blade thrust into the sky. Um, I would hear of your past victories in the war or of recent events. Have you not yet tired of my tales, Linux? I do admit, I never tire of telling them. <laughs> Very well then. Let me champion the feats of my conquest. Let the glory of Kairos' realm fall in any years that would hear of it. If but you could have come with me, my sister, on my latest mission to Haven. It was a rousing venture, rife with bloodshed and intrigue. Inspired by the Vendrian Guard, House Decanius had a change of heart regarding her loyalties to the Overlord. So I rode without rest on rumors that they had fled to Arden. Several days of hounding passed before I was able to locate them and rend their bellies. By my blade, the blood that once ruled Haven ran red in the streets. Farewell. Uh, so we can also talk with Tunin. You return. It's gratifying to see that the war has not caused you to forget your roots. What is it you wish to know? Tell me about Kairos. Kairos is our overlord. She ushers us from the brink of chaos with a stern hand and gestures to the way of peace. We are only too eager to follow in her perfect example. So how old is Kairos? By our reckoning, her age upon Teratus is magnificent. Her true span defies measurement by our limited construct of time. It would be a waste to spend our few, pitiable years attempting to solve that riddle of existence. Think of Kairos not as subject to beginnings or endings. Kairos is, and Kairos will ever be. So, uh, what is your relationship to Kairos? She is my master, and I her dutiful pupil. In this respect, you and I are no different. I have the honor of Kairos' confidence. She trusts me to enact her law upon the boundless territory of her rule. I am only too grateful to serve. I am the voice of Kairos' will, the harbinger of her judgment, and the arm of her justice. Uh, that... I feel like that's a bad question, but let's go for it. Yep. Yeah, I knew it. That is an irrelevant question. Kairos is law, and it is the responsibility of fairness to conform to Kairos' definition of it, and anyone who believes otherwise is an agent of anarchy. Contemplate this as you deliver Kairos' peace to the frontier. If you fail to understand the importance and immutability of Kairos' law, then your work is but a perversion of justice. Uh, that also gains wrath. Um, so there's... I, I'm not going to ask that. Tell me about Blood and Mark. He is my headsman, an assassin without equal. His official designation in Kairos' hierarchy is the Archon of Shadows, though I wonder that he ever considers himself aught but a slayer of the unjust. So how'd he earn his title? His work away from the court takes blood and marsh to the dark places of the world, the tears and Northern Empire alike. Over time, shadows become his dominion. They cloak him, protect him, and even fight for him if the need arises. It is said that Blood and Mark can travel to any place where shadows are cast. Only he would know this for certain. Uh, does Blood and Mark serve you alone? Your question is flawed. We are all servants of Kairos. The Archons are also agents of their own interests. Those chosen few empowered to bring order to the world in accordance with Kairos' peace. At present, Blood and Mark is my vassal, and I his patron. The relationship is not so different from Graven Ash and Cairn. The Fallen Archon are the voices of Narat and his songbird, Siren. Such partnerings and apprenticeships are common. They provide mutual benefits to the Archons involved, as well as a measure of oversight. Back to my other questions. Curious about you, Archon. Curiosity is not a trait that I encourage in my servants. Too often have I witnessed such activity leading down a path to lawlessness. However, if you feel that a better understanding of me will inform your work, then I will allow it. What would you know? Tell me about your rise to become adjudicator. Curb your ambition, student. My path to this day is not one that could be replicated under any circumstances. However, if your curiosity is determined, I will tell my story. Forgive me, Your Honor. I only wish to know my master better. I came to the world centuries ago, before the dream of a unified northern empire was fully realized. My home country lay far from the borders of Kairos' realm, and our conquest was a matter of distant speculation. Decades before rumor of Kairos' approach grew in panic volume, I, familiar some, I familiarized myself with the intricacies of her law. It took me no time at all to realize the benefits of our inevitable subjugation. 
took it upon myself to rise in my country's governance as an arbitrator, as an arbiter of law and drafter of covenants, building some notoriety for my execution of fair justice. As my influence and the trust of my people evolved, my decisions transcended to define future precedent. Go on. What my countrymen could not have surmised was that I had woven into our customs the very backbone of Kairos' law. I set the stage for the conquest of our floundering nation to join the Overlord's Empire. By the time the Overlord's armies presented themselves and offered terms of surrender, we had adopted Kairos' peace in all but name. Our absorption into the Northern Empire was a matter of legal formality, negligible changes to our already beloved document of law. People credited me as the architecture of peace and for a time called me Tune and Fair. As my importance grew in their estimate, Kairos could not help but learn of the part I played in her bloodless victory. Kairos' law has a breadth of intricacies that is unapproachable to the masses. I was chosen to interpret and represent the Overlord's will across the Northern Empire and beyond, this time as adjudicator. It is my pride, my duty, my life. What does it mean to be an Archon? I am a figure of power and significance, and under Kairos' mandate, I am able to exercise my authority for the benefit of all. Had I not earned the Overlord's approval, I would not stand tall before you. Uh, could anyone become an Archon? I think that's Wrath. Absolutely not. Only a precious few grow into this authority. Were it otherwise, Teratus would descend to Pandemonium. Of those few who rise into power, fewer still have the self-control to make lawful use of their talents. Those who can, fewer still are deemed worthy of Kairos' approval. Um, did you come into power yourself, or did Kairos foster your talents? An astute question. Doubtless I exhibited some spark of potential on my own, insignificant, though enough to accomplish deeds of note. Only under Kairos' tutelage have I grown to these heights. Is every Archon subservient to Kairos? All are subservient before Kairos, but intuit your meaning. The Overlord's great the Overlord takes great pains to recognize potential. Before an Archon comes into power, they will have faced the harshest scrutiny. By an agent of recruitment, if not blend, Mark himself. Those who are found worthy of incredible deeds, but refuse to join their strength to the needs of the Empire, are doomed to die. Those who wish to make a name for themselves are invited to the Fold to serve and rule the needs of the Empire. That is the price of power in Kairos' hierarchy. Questions about you. Uh, did you come up with the Office of Fate Binders? Indirectly, yes. Just as I am the representative of Kairos' law across Teratus, you are the face of my judgment for the people. I took inspiration from the Overlord's example, as we all should. The people need an approachable face to sell their grievances, and I am not available to, adjudicate, yeah, to adjudicate on every sharecropper's dispute. The Fate Binders were an inevitable solution. Um, why is curiosity such a problem? Because my vassals are not selected for their independence of thought. You are an agent of law, the execution of which falls within strict confines. Your intellect may aid the task ahead of you, but your unwavering obedience is of greater value to me. Um, I understand, Archon. Be sure that you do. Back to my previous questions. Matters of law. Then you are well situated, for my court is the legal heart of this corrupt and uncivilized realm. What matters draw your curiosity. You are already well versed in Kairos' laws, but I am happy to discuss the particulars. I wish to discuss Kairos' peace. The cornerstone of our wartime efforts, of course. Kairos' peace guarantees all willing supplicants under the Overlord's authority a place in her world. The exact wording of the bylaw is, Your life is not yours to discard. The Overlord has plans for you. This extends to several spheres of influence. Among others, it grants protection to enemies who surrender in time of war, and it forbids suicide. To dispense with the Overlord's vassal and property is prohibited. Remind me how the Overlord's name may be used. It is not forbidden to cross one's tongue with Kairos' name, but it behooves one to use caution and respect. The Overlord's name is not yours to give, whether to progeny, product, location, or abstraction. Slander of the Overlord is punishable by death. There is only one Kairos, and her name is safeguarded. No one may say Kairos and have it ab obfuscated, obfuscated by a second meaning. Neither will a name be associated to trivialities. A gambler will not attribute his fortune to Kairos' luck or his, or his misfortune to Kairos' scorn. 
Such an association lowers the overlord in the public estimate and is rightfully considered slander most foul. Let us discuss the old walls. Old walls are forbidden, as are their contents and their denizens. Owning any item from the old walls is considered trespass, regardless of it came to your possession, mind then the course of your travels. As the old walls extend across much of the tiers and northern empire alike, Harris permits her servants to pass only where she has sculpted the landscape to permit traverse. Under no circumstances are you to enter a breach in the old walls, even for a task as innocent as crossing to the other side. If these restrictions seem too severe, I would remind you that they are for the protection of Kairos' servants. The Overlord has no desire to see harm needlessly inflicted upon her loyal followers. Remind me of the magician's folly. Practitioners of the arcane arts must be sanctioned by one of Kairos' guilds, such as blood chanters or forgebound. Rogue magicians with a tenuous grasp of unknown powers will not be tolerated. A sanctioned mage whose spellcasting causes damage to life or property is lawfully deemed in innocent. As long as they practice their art in the service of Kairos, all is forgiven. Uh, let us, let's speak of quotas and sharing. The harvest blooms and blights by the wolf Kairos. In times of lean, you will be fed. In times of wealth, you will feed others. Uh, this law is a sizable category unto itself, serving many needs at once, trade and tax being only two examples. The broadest intent of the law is to empower Kairos' subjects to care for their neighbor and expect care in return. Uh, it's fucking socialism. It's disgusting. Um, you might take note of the law's application in trade. Merchants' right to peddle their wares is defined by permits granted annually. The regional authority has a right to decide if a merchant sells cabbage one year and sandals the next. Anyone breaking through their restrictions is, is subject to immediate forfeiture of all assets. You need not concern yourself over the nuances, at least until they apply to this contested realm in the time of peace. I'm curious about the restriction on forbidden knowledge. Garros herself set the standards of what can and cannot be known. These restrictions are rarely enforced, but they are worth taking into account. During the war, for example, during the war, for example, Kairos deemed the knowledge of the Vellum Citadel taboo. No one may possess the wisdom of that fallen re repository, save Kairos herself. Lantry calling it taboo seems a bit oh seems a bit like overkill, but to play Kairos' advocate, the world would hardly be safer if all had access to the lore of making po poisons, or the art of arming brigands and fine bronze. This is for the protection of her subjects. Before the coming of Kairos, during the ages of anarchy and discord, Powerful knowledge and undeserving hands leveled empires without thought or mercy. Garros has no desire to revisit those dark times. Am I beholden to these laws? That should not be in question. We are all subjects of Kairos. Her laws define and regulate our very way of life. That said, as an agent in law, you're granted more leeway than a soldier or citizen. You may find yourself compelled to commit morally questionable acts in the name of Kairos. If it serves the court's justice, much may be forgiven. If the, courts find, if the court finds any of your actions suspect, we will summon you to answer for yourself. Your testimony will, your testimony will be heard and judgment rendered. Uh, we gain favor. So you're exceedingly curious about the application of Kairos' law. I find it refreshing that you would seek my counsel, Fate Binder. Uh, back to previous questions. No more questions. Be on our way. Alright, so we're already level 4 with uh, Kairos. That's a court officer. Alright, so there's a woman. Uh, any petitioners that displease Tunin would meet their fate in the pits below the court. Kairos is standard and imposing sight for both conquered and unconquered alike. Uh, so on that note, let's quick save. On that note, um... I'm just going to wrap a couple things up. Uh, I'm going to talk to Lady Lucradius. This well-dressed older woman stands apart from the milling crowds of nobles. Uh, stares off in the distance, oblivious to your approach until you're right in front of her. Oh, greetings! Andra Lucradius, formerly of Thistleholm. You have the look of someone who belongs here. A fate binder, no doubt? Do you need something from me? So, uh, what are all of these nobles doing in Tunin's court? Trying to look brave, I warn, but if you crane an ear to any of their conversations, you'll hear a different tale. Three years since Toon set up shop in the Bastard City, we're still getting used to our new masters and figuring out what we can and can't ask of them. Uh, 
These are smart, ring-plenty folk. The way they approach Tunin, you'd think they were raised under a tyrant's lash. Some have come to settle agreement, others to pledge fealty. I've been standing around long enough to know that the adjudicator doesn't care for empty gestures. How has the bastard city fared since the conquest? The armies claimed the city in a quieter, more organized manner than I might have expected. I can credit them that much to be sure. The outlying villages and farms are a little sparse, but with the scarred cores harvesting for new soldiers, Tunin has done a fair job managing food shortages. Garros' forces made short work of our local mages. I never approved of the school of Wild Wrath, but at least there were ours to control. I'm not sure that the blood chanters I see on patrol are a better alternative. We've suffered our share of hardships, but it seems that Kairos wants us alive. Uh, that's a more generous outcome than some of us were led to believe. So, uh, what brings a noble like yourself to Tunin's court? Uh, like the rest of the Frieden inbreds here, I came to see Tunin and ask him to right a wrong. My manor was destroyed during the conquest. I told the adjudicator my woes, but we didn't exactly see eye to eye. Tell me of yourself. I'm a daughter of noble house. We are wealthy enough to live in the city, but our means uh, beyond that were limited. My mother dealt in fish, textiles, and bronze. By the time I inherited, the business was taking care of itself. <coughs> of course, all of that has changed. This old home is no more, and my name has none of its former weight. Even if we were still in business, Kairos' laws would stifle our trading rights. Perhaps it's better this way. What is Thistleholm? No. It was my family's ancestral hall. The oldest stones date back to the years when the bastard city was not but a dozen roofs and wagons clustering for warmth. Compared to the houses of the great lords, it was nothing special. Age had softened the wood, and its queer placement in the warehouse district set apart from the finer grounds where lords and ladies strolled for amusement. It was a mess, but our mess all the same. I invite you over for tea, something stronger even, but it would only disappoint you'll find not there but a gaping hole. So your home was in the warehouse district? You must understand that Thistle Home predated the city districts. My grandmother was also a persistent woman. Merchants storing salted con lamprey eggs on the adjoining grounds were no cause for her, for her to bulge from her spot. What happened? Collateral damage happened. When the adjudicator cast a judgment on the bastard city, he destroyed the districts of the corrupt merchant kings. Their manors, their counting houses, and yes, their warehouses. Aged, dignified Thistleholm collapsed as a massive think sinkhole opened under her foundation. The bastard city's laws may not have been perfect by Kairos' standard, but my family followed them with respect. and never took a copper ring more than we deserved. I can't help but feel that my estate was not the criminal Tunin had in mind during the sentencing. So what are you going to do next? That's a question, isn't it? I appealed to the adjudicator, thinking he would see reason. After considering my case for all of eight seconds, he awarded me a bout of rings and a plot of land on the outskirts of the city. Tunin told me to build anew and start farming. Farming? Can you believe that? It's not even that I'm opposed to labor but we're in a war. I can't have the scarred cores breathing down my neck, raiding my crops, and... And Kairos knows what else. Kairos' laws are made to serve the masses, not the individual. I can appreciate that, especially when they're suffering or corruption on a grand scale. It all makes sense on parchment, doesn't it? I come from a long line of smart, ring-savvy merchants, but even I can't reconcile Tunin's justice with Kairos' law. There's something wrong about it all. Maybe Tuna knows something I don't, or maybe... Uh, what do you mean? People come here for justice. They usually get a version of it, but it's Tunin's version, not theirs. Half of the time, they don't even get what they wanted out of a ruling in their favor. The deed to the farm, for instance. That's put my own ignorance on display, but if more people even... But if more people knew how Kairos' laws worked, they might not need... They might not come here seeking a ruling at all, even a fair one. Tunin is a servant of law, but he's the overlord's vassal as much as any of us. Sometimes it seems like he uses his position to twist everything in the Empire's favor. We're just pieces on a board, and he can move us wherever the law justifies that we stand. That doesn't sound, well, legal. Tunin isn't one to change his mind, unfair as it might seem, 
the ruling stands. I had no thought to dispute the ruling, but I appreciate the kindness of your tone all the same. It's an uncommon thing to find the Bastard City these days. Farewell, Fate Finder. Be well. Alright, so let's head out. If we can. Kapoof. Welcome back, kid. Amusing as it would be to watch the edict drop. I guess I'm glad you lived. Side with the scarred course, huh? He likes secrets and trickery. Yeah, he's not a big fan of us. So, uh... Time was of the essence, but Ash was slow to act. I signed with the Archon that could ensure my survival. And now we gain more favor. 19, not a lot. It's not surprising that he'd be cautious. Ash's legion has warred without reinforcements for years. Unlike the voices, when his soldiers die, his army dwindles. I imagine you're off to meet with voices for, well, whatever it is he has in mind, but first you and I need to have a little chit-chat. I'm listening. Everyone's keeping an eye on you, because you did something nobody has done before. Gotta guess as what that might be. Um, and, and the first to resolve an edict before its consequences came to pass. And he says, close, but not quite. It's rare, but it's not the first time that Kairos has issued an edict primarily as a threat. Providing the target sufficient time and motivation to comply in order to avoid the edict's punishing effects. Claiming an edict isn't new, neither is surviving or resolving the commandments of an edict, but you're the first to proclaim and resolve the very same edict, and it didn't kill you. In one fell swoop, you survived your second edict, resolved the very one you had proclaimed, and woke an arcane structure that had slept for several centuries. Um... And now I go on your short list of people who stand out as potential problems. More or less, mostly more. I don't care what you do with the information, but you should know the danger you're in now that you've put yourself on the map. When you're dealing with voices, don't forget that he'll be doing everything he can to figure out what makes you different. And now he can use it for his own gain. Thanks for the advice. He shrugs. So let's see. Uh, we have two favor. That is more than I ever had before. But uh, on that note, let us quick save again. Uh, let's check. Well, we can look at factions. Lantry. Uh, we have the Wheel of Ages. Um, it's slowing aura. It's slowing aura around a party member. Um, so everyone's slowed. That'd be useful for like Barrack. It's once per rest. Um, yeah, that's really good. So, Blood and Mark. Um, yeah, he did. He doesn't like that we side with uh, the Scarlet Chorus, but that's fine. But, uh, so yeah. Uh, anyways, I want to thank everyone for uh, tuning in this time. Uh, next, we will be going to... We already did this. Okay, so all evidence will be here. So we have evidence against Graven Ash and against the voice of Narad. So we are going to be getting a bunch of different things. We have dissonance of war and still stirring visions. So we have access to Haven. The region spires attached to the old walls. Um, if I recall... If I recall, I think I think that he's letting us go in. Maybe. Yeah, he's letting us go in to uh to check out some of the uh the the shipment of ore and everything. Um, see what's going on. So uh, we'll go to um. We'll go to the crossing in the next episode. Uh, until then, I hope everyone has a great day. And this is Black Mama 44, out.